So today we're talking about anger. And before we get into that, just want to, a comment. Anybody else ever notice that emoticons are getting really awesome? I mean, it used to be, it used to be that you could type an email or a text to somebody, and then you'd make just you just make a little colon and a little bracket to make a little smiley, and it kind of improved the tone just in case anybody was wondering if you were friendly or not. You could clarify that you're friendly by putting your little colon and your little bracket. Only emoticons have gotten just completely out of control. I I keep seeing all of these animated emoticons that move and do little stuff and then I I just I actually just downloaded a emoticon keyboard onto my my iPhone so I was feeling like I'd really I've kind of lost it at this point now that there's like a whole keyboard full of emoticons that I can can choose for my next text message. I have to play with it. I haven't done it yet. But so if you get strange texts from me with just long strings of emoticons, I'm just playing with my phone. But um, I I brought in a a few pictures of just ones that I've seen lately that I liked. I like this guy. He's got his little sunglasses on. It's like the smiley face, but it's like the bonus smiley face, the the cool guy smiley face. And then there's the bonus frowny face. But this is, I like this one because there's a lot of days where I feel like a frowny face just doesn't really cut it. And I want, I want actual tears. I like the, I like the actual tears on this one. And then I'm not really sure what this one is supposed to be. He looks like disturbed, sort of alarmed. I like to think that he's experiencing extreme social anxiety. Like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Um, I don't really know what this one is either. I just like it. I, I can't figure out what to do with him, but he's, he's pretty cool looking. And then this is one of my favorites. I could really have used this one last week. I had the stomach flu last week, and I felt so bad, and I, and I wished that that guy was available so I could text it to all of my friends and say, this is, this is how I'm feeling right now. Um, our son Daniel is a, he's a pretty good artist, and he likes to, he's a, a very fancy doodler. So he was recently doodling his own little facial expressions, and I asked him if I could show you guys some of, the, some of his emotional doodles. So here's a, a, another selection. These are, these are Daniel's pictures. Let me see if I can get them up. Here we go. Okay, so I did my, just my top five. There were a bunch, but this is the first one. This is defiant. And number four, crazed. And then uh, here's my number three, horrified. Like, he looks a little bit more scared than the, than the other guy. And then this one is suspicious. And then my number one favorite of the, the emotional doodles is this one, dumbstruck. That's my, that's my favorite. Um, but in kind of in all seriousness, as much as just emoticons are really fun and little emotional doodles are are fun. I think it's actually kind of a healthy trend in our culture because sometimes it's hard for us to to express our feelings and it's hard for us to even sometimes know what we're feeling and sometimes just having some kind of little tool just to say, oh, that one, that's the thing that I'm feeling right there and I don't know how to put, how to put words on it, but I, I want to be able to express it in some way or another. And so we're going to be talking about an anger this morning, which is an emotion and how to deal with our anger in an appropriate way. And I want to read for you the, the question that this message came from because it was a little bit on the, the complicated side. So here is a paraphrase of the question that we received related to anger. It says, when the Bible says we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, does this refer to all types of anger or only to anger in specific situations? For instance, are there occasions for what is called righteous anger? And the person says, for instance, I get angry when I read about child abuse, human trafficking, and other forms of social injustice. Should I be slow to anger in these cases too? Um, and so I think this is a really excellent question. 
what what actually is meant by be slow to anger and how are we supposed to engage this and is it the same in all situations or is it different in different situations and so that's what we're going to address right now and just as we come into that let's take a minute just to pray and invite the Lord to come and to speak to us Lord we just thank you for your direction and your guidance in our lives and God, I ask that you would help us to better understand your word. God, I ask that you would show us uh, how you want us to deal with our feelings and what it is that you're teaching, and that you would be with us this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So first thing to know about anger that's been mentioned already is that anger is an emotion, right? And as an emotion, anger is not really something which is either righteous or unrighteous. Uh, a good thing when it comes to our feelings is it's important for us to avoid judging ourselves or others based on how we feel. A feeling or an emotion is an experience. It's not something that we do. It's something that we experience. And it's best not to judge ourselves on what we experience on what we feel, but we judge ourselves on what we do. We judge our behavior based on our actions, not based on our feelings. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 addresses this well when it says, Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And so where it says right here, be angry, it's clear that you, you haven't done something wrong yet if you're angry. You can be angry without sinning, without doing something that's wrong. And yet at the same time, there's kind of a warning in there, isn't there? It's, it, there's an implication that if you're angry, there is a good chance that you are about to make a mistake. Um, and also there's this encouragement that if you are angry, this is something to be free from as soon as possible. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. But again, the anger itself is not being referred to as a sin. So not only is anger, so anger is not righteous, anger is not unrighteous, um, but anger is actually useful. Um, anger is a useful clue that something is wrong. Um, a good way to think about this is if you are in a situation where anger is in play. Is it a good situation or a bad situation? Let's say I go to my friend's house for dinner, and as I pull up in their driveway and I start to walk up to their front door, I hear the sound of angry voices. And there's an elevated voice, and it sounds kind of tense, and anger seems to be happening in the house. Am I thinking this has been a good day for my friends or a bad day for my friends? Am I thinking this bodes well for our evening together, or am I thinking that this may not really be the best time to, to be walking in the front door right now? Anger happens in bad situations, right? And it doesn't necessarily mean that the person who is experiencing anger is doing something wrong. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the person that they're angry at is doing something wrong, but something is wrong if anger is going on. There's some kind of a problem which needs to be resolved. And we, we experience very classic symptoms when we start to feel angry, right? Often there's, a, there's kind of a rush of adrenaline and people's heart rate starts to go up. Their breathing starts to increase. You might feel tense. Sometimes you might feel hot or cold. Uh, I know for me that when I feel angry, I, I start to tremble. I feel my body, body physically kind of shaking when I'm angry and my voice volume increases and my voice has a tendency to tremble just like the rest of my body and these are signs that we're angry, right? Now when we're experiencing these things, we're starting to tremble, we're feeling hot, we're, are, we're feeling an adrenaline rush, our heart rate is elevated, we still haven't done anything wrong yet, right? And yet, and yet, it's when those feelings start to happen that we're often kind of right on the edge of doing something wrong. Something bad might be about to happen. So anger is a useful cue that something is wrong, but anger is also dangerous. Okay, uh, 
often when we're angry, we have incredibly poor judgment. People who are angry tend to make very bad decisions. And again, it doesn't mean that anger itself is bad. It just means that anger is dangerous. You could think about this kind of like a flammable gas or something like that, a, a, a explosive substance of some kind or another. It's not that the substance itself is something which is bad, but it's something that needs to be handled with extreme care because it's dangerous, because some kind of explosion could happen. I had a crazy experience with an angry woman in the car once a few years ago. I was driving down Nobel in the University City area and I had I was in a lane which was about to be a right turn only lane, only I didn't want to turn right, I wanted to go straight and there was a lot of traffic to my left and I had my turn signal on and I'm trying to get out of this lane because I don't want to drive a mile down Genesee in the wrong direction. So I keep trying to find a way to get into the, the lane in order to avoid turning right and nobody will let me in. I'm just getting no love. It's just wall to wall, people kind of scooting up, you know, how they, they inch their way up to, to the bumper of the car in front of them so you can't possibly squeeze in. And I'm getting really frustrated and I'm thinking, this is just ridiculous. And I'm, I'm gonna seriously end up driving you know, a mile in the wrong direction looking for a U-turn spot because because nobody will let me take cuts in front of them just to get out of this lane. So finally, I just start edging the front of my bumper in, and I'm just sort of squeezing in, and the woman in the other car is squeezing up, and we're kind of having this chicken fight over this lane at a red light. And, and I win the little chicken fight, and I make it into the lane so I don't have to turn right, and I'm thinking it's all over. Thank goodness I finally changed lanes, but this, this woman starts to freak out. And she starts honking her horn, like beep, beep, beep with a horn. And then her, her hand's in the air, and she's waving her middle finger back and forth while honking. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is, this is bad. So we start to move forward, and she actually suddenly accelerates, swerves around, and cuts in front of me. And then she starts weaving her car back and forth across the lanes of traffic so that I can't get around her. And I'm just like... At this point, I'm starting to be scared. I'm thinking about these stories I've heard of crazy people with road rage and thinking something, something really insane is, going, is about to happen here. I finally just turned down a side street and went a mile or so in the wrong direction just to get away from her. Um, so that was a little crazy. That was, that was a little bit extreme in terms of anger at people trying to change lanes on Nobel. Um, but Really, I'm thinking in spite of the fact that this woman was experiencing something, who knows what was going on in her life at that moment that made her react that way. You know, her behavior seems really crazy, but I'm, I'm thinking really realistically for most of us, can we say during the times that we felt really angry that we behaved rationally and made good choices and said things that we would like to support later? Um, I know for me, I often, after I've been angry, I think, what happened? Why, why did I say that? Why would I do that? I had a, a, a big argument with a college roommate back in my 20s, and it was over the dumbest thing. Remember, we had planned to go to the beach with some friends, and then she had gotten on the phone, and then she had talked on the phone for an hour to somebody. And then when she finally got off the phone, we're like, okay, good, we're gonna finally go to the beach. And then I decided to take a shower. And she was really annoyed that I was gonna take a shower and wasn't ready to go to the beach. And when I was in the bathroom getting out of my shower, I heard her telling our other friends how incredibly lame it was that I didn't take my shower while she was on the phone because I should have, I should have gotten that done so that as soon as she got off the phone, we could have left. And I'm sitting there just in the bathroom steaming. I cannot believe, I'm drying myself off. I cannot believe she's saying these things about me. She's saying all these things in front of our friends. And you know, like, and this is the person, I mean, I would understand if it was somebody else in the room who was feeling annoyed that I was making us more late, but it's the person who we waited for for an hour while she talked on the phone saying, we should all wait for her and we shouldn't wait for me. And by the time I got out of the bathroom, I was just mad 
and kind of lit into her and she lit back into me and we had this screaming match over you know a shower before a beach trip I mean, it was the most ridiculous screaming match that I that I have ever had, and I'm feeling these and I'm feeling these these physical symptoms that we're talking about. I can feel my heart rate is elevated. I'm starting to tremble. I'm feeling really frustrated. I'm starting to cry. I always cry when I'm angry, and I hate it. I'm starting to cry, and I'm starting to shake all over, and I'm and it's just ridiculous. And there was there was one moment when I thought, you know what, I really want to do what what I would really what my body wants to do right now is just hit her. That's what my body wanted to do. Now, I, fortunately, I did not do that. So I demonstrated some level of self-control. And I instead, I just shut the door to my room and spent a little bit of time by myself. But it was scary. I felt frightened. You know, when the thought hit me that what my, what my body wants to do right now is hit this person, I thought, wow, that's, that's scary. This, this is a dangerous experience that I'm having and I need to I need to get control over myself and over my feelings and so our our anger is dangerous and that's why the Bible takes so much time and trouble to counsel us on how to deal with this particular emotion um, so we're gonna go to the Bible we're gonna look at James chapter 1 where the, our question comes from when our, our question asker said what's What's meant by be slow to anger? This comes from James chapter 1, verses 19 to 20, and we're going to look at those right now. If we can get them to come up. There we go. Okay. It says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because our anger does not produce the righteousness that... God desires. Um, one thing I specifically like about this verse is it tells us why. It doesn't just say everyone should be slow to anger, but it says why we should be slow to anger. Because our anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. And when we're talking about this, this concept of righteous anger, I think we can go right to this verse and we can look at this and we see that according to the scriptures, there's not such a thing as human beings having righteous anger. It's, it's not really a biblical concept. What, what the Bible is actually saying is that human anger does not produce righteousness. Righteousness does not come from our anger. And, and I think where this concept comes from instead is there's, we have a human need to categorize things as being either okay or not okay. And we like to judge ourselves again on how we feel. Like it is, this behavior of mine is okay. I feel my feelings are justified or this behavior is not okay. And it's not justified. But from God's perspective, it's never it's never a matter of what is permissible and what is not permissible. It's a matter of what is good. When God teaches us how to live, when Jesus taught us how to live, it was not here is the list of rules and these are the you know rather undesirable behaviors which are okay and the rather undesirable behaviors which are not okay, but it's this is the best way to live. This is the good way to live. And every time we try to justify ourselves, when, when Jesus hears these kinds of questions, he comes back with a response directing us toward the heart and directing us away from the rule book and toward what is actually good. Um, an example would be when he's asked about divorce. People ask, you know, hey, basically, under what circumstances can I divorce my wife with impunity? When, and under what circumstances is it okay to get divorced? And Jesus doesn't say, okay, here's the rules. Here's good divorce, here's bad divorce. Okay, what Jesus says is, guys, divorce is always bad. He doesn't give us a list of rules for how to handle divorce. He says, just divorce is bad. Now, that doesn't mean that there's never any circumstance under which a marriage is so abusive that it's time to get out. Um, but what it does mean, and if you'll just kind of, if you'll just excuse my language for a minute, what, what, what it does mean is divorce sucks, which is something we all already know, right? It's a, it's a bad thing. 
When divorce is going on, people, people are unhappy, people are getting hurt, negative things are, are happening. And this is something that you want to be avoiding. It's not something where there's cases where you can do it with impunity and cases where you can't. He gets asked another question where the Bible specifically tells us that this young man is trying to justify himself. And, and, he, and a young man asks Jesus this question which has become well known. You know, who is my neighbor? In response to the teaching that we need to love our neighbor as ourselves. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And this young man says to Jesus, okay, but who counts? Who's my neighbor? Who do I have to be nice to? Tell me who I can not be nice to with impunity and who I have to be nice to. Give me a nice, tidy list of who I have to do good things toward and who I don't have to do good things toward. And Jesus' response is the same as it always is. is there's, there's no rule book for who you have to be nice to and who you don't have to be nice to. This, it's a lifestyle of generosity that I'm calling you to, that I want you to enter into and own on a heart level. And we get the story of the Good Samaritan, where, where one man has compassion on another man. And Jesus says, be like that. But there is no person that we can, without any guilt whatsoever, ignore their concerns. Now that, again, doesn't mean that all of the problems of the entire world rest on our shoulders and we're personally responsible to save everyone from their troubles. But it does mean that Jesus is not giving us an out. There's no out. In this case, it's okay not to care for your neighbor. This person doesn't count. And, and in the same way, when we're dealing with anger, there's no, there's no, this is a case where it's okay just to engage your anger and be really mad. And this is a case where it's, and this is a case where it's not okay to engage your anger. Um, and I think it's important for us to be careful with that because there's, there are two sides that are both dangerous. And one is, is judging ourselves for our feelings, which is it's not fair and it's not productive. And we say, oh, I, f I, feel, I feel guilty because I'm angry and I shouldn't be angry. My feelings are wrong. And then there's the flip side where it's, I'm angry and I'm right and I should be angry and I'm justified in being angry. And basically what that all ends up amounting to is self-righteousness. We kind of pronounce judgment on the other person that we're angry and we pronounce goodness upon ourselves and we become self-righteous. And then once we have these judgmental attitudes and judgmental actions toward others, we we have, we've gone from having a feeling to being in trouble and doing something which is wrong. Um, another good thing just to know about anger is that the Lord is the one who sets the example for us. A beautiful thing about this passage that we just looked at where we're told, be slow to anger, is what we're really being told is to be like God. Um, I want to look at another passage. This is from Psalm 103, and it has a lot of the same words in it. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. And so we see here that it's God who's slow to anger. So when we're told, be slow to anger, what we're really being told is, be like God. And when we're told, don't let the sun go down on your anger, who set the example for that? It's God himself who sets the example for us of not holding on to anger, but, but releasing it right away. Um, and, and I think this is a really, a, just a beautiful and exciting thing for us to know, that that we're made in the image of an emotional God. And Jamie addressed this a few weeks ago when he talked about the suffering series, that sometimes we like to paint this picture of God as being um, without emotion. He's, he's impassive. He doesn't have feelings. And one thing that Jamie pointed out to us is this, this picture of God doesn't come from the Bible. 
the biblical description of God is one of an emotional God. Just in this passage that we're, that we're looking at right here, we notice that God feels a lot of things. First of all, God feels anger at injustice and unfaithfulness. If you read the Old Testament, you see God saying over and over and over again, I am angry, I am angry, I am angry, I am angry. And sometimes it freaks people out. People read the Bible and especially read passages in the Old Testament. Oh my goodness, God is just mad. God is just, he's angry over and over and over again. And it starts to feel kind of scary. Like, oh my goodness, we have this very scary, very angry God. Um, but I think it's also comforting to know that God gets angry at injustice and unfaithfulness because the things that make God feel angry are man's inhumanity to man. When people treat each other unjustly, when people hurt one another, that makes God angry. And when, he is, when people don't treat him well, when people say things about him that are not true, he tells Job's friends, I'm mad at you guys because you're saying things about me that aren't true and I don't like it. So when we mistreat him and when we mistreat other people, God gets angry. And, and I think that's a good thing. It's a good thing for us to know that God cares. He cares how we're treated. He cares how we treat other people. It matters to him. Um, so it's comforting to know that God gets angry about those things. And I think it's also comforting for us to know that our experience of anger is like God. That when we feel anger, we're not, we're not feeling some entirely human thing, which is all bad. But we're feeling something that God himself actually feels. Something else that God feels, God feels compassion. And compassion both for the sinner and for the sinned against. We just read, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, uh, abounding in love. The Hebrew word that's translated compassion here is rahum, which comes from the word rahem, which means womb. And it refers to a mother's love for her children. Uh, wh what's being described here is it's saying, God has for us um, a mother's love, the extreme tenderness and fierce protective love of a mother is how God feels for us. And it says that God has compassion on all that he has made. He has rahum on all of us, both those who have sinned and those who have not sinned, the victims of the sin and the perpetrators of the sin. Uh, my children, one time when they were really small, uh, our, our two sons, I think maybe, maybe Daniel was four and Josh was two or something like that, were driving in the car and they're getting bored sitting in their car seats in the back seat. And I, I had a little, just like a little bite-sized brownie, kind of bite-sized for an adult, but pretty big for a two-year-old. And I, I handed it back to my, to my son, to Daniel, and I said, here, share this with your brother. And he took that brownie, and he took the whole thing, and he shoved the whole thing straight in his mouth. And I was so mad. I was absolutely livid. Because there was my sweet, adorable little two-year-old that I had intended to give a treat to, and this other child just greedily took the whole thing and didn't give him any, without any thought for my little baby, just ate the whole thing, and I was mad. And I'm just, you know, and I'm driving in my car, and I'm just letting my four-year-old have it. I'm like, I can't believe you would do that. That's so selfish. That's so mean. And I'm, I'm, I'm starting to just get all, all emotional. And then my, my, my little four-year-old son started to cry. And his mouth hung open with, with the, the partially chewed brownie still inside it. <laughs> and just started to wail. And my mother's heart broke completely in two, because I knew that he was, that all of a sudden this, this treat that I had intended for him had lost all of its joy. 
and he was just devastated that I was so angry at him and devastated that he'd done something which was selfish and he couldn't take it back anymore. It was too late to take it back. There wasn't anything he could do to fix it. And I knew it had lost all of its taste. I know what it feels like when something good loses all of its joy. And my, my heart broke for my son, for my son the sinned, against and for my son the sinner. And, and I just, and, and I, I melted into an emotional wreck like lots of young mothers who don't get very much sleep um, <laughs> often do over little things like brownies. And you can tell it actually still makes me cry. Um, and it's just a, and it's just a tiny, a tiny silly little thing. But you know, if if a mother, you know, still cries a decade and a half afterwards over, over seeing her children hurt, how much more so does God's heart break for us over the things that we do to one another? How broken is God's heart when when we're hurt? when injustice happens, when, when people should share and they don't. And how much does God's heart break for those that, for us when we do wrong, when we make a mistake and we can't take it back? Because both of us are God's children. Because we're God's children in the moments when we're good and in the moments when we're bad and God's heart breaks for each and every one of us. There's not anything that we can do that's so bad that God doesn't break for his child. Um, and so in, in his love, God consistently, he chooses mercy over judgment over and over and over again. This is why we have the cross. This is why we have all of the amazing things that God has ever done for us because, because he's got to reconcile those things. And so again, the instruction to be slow to anger is the instruction to, to be like God. Um, so we're just going to run through what, is, what does it look like to, for us to emulate this, to be like God in our anger. And so we're just going to walk through a, a godly approach to anger. First of all, um, when you're feeling angry, slow down. Remember that when we're angry, we tend to make bad choices and that reacting in our anger does not ever lead to righteousness. So the first thing is just stop. Don't react. Proceed forward with caution, a rule that we have in our house at this point. Jamie and I have started to be aware of those physical signs we were talking about. Like, when is that, when is that point when you start to notice you're getting tense? When you start to notice that your voice volume is no longer in your control and your body is trembling and those kinds of things. And the rule in our house right now is that when that happens, we take a five-minute break it's mutually agreed on, and we walk away, and we go to separate rooms, and we do something else, and then we come back, and we try again to have this conversation after we've had a chance just to, to calm down. Um, second thing, listen with compassion. Be like God in our compassion, and listen. Remember, be slow to speak. Be quick to listen, and be slow to speak and slow to anger. So the first thing that we do, instead of become angry, instead of say anything, is to listen, and to listen with godly compassion. Listen to yourself. And this thing is having issues. There we go. So listen to yourself. Ask yourself questions. What am I feeling? Oh, I feel angry. Um, what's causing me to feel angry? And what else is going on with me? What's going on with me internally that's, that's making me feel this? And is it, is it even rational for me to be feeling angry right now? Or is there something else going on? Am I just feeling stressed out? Am I just late and stressed out? Um, what is it about this other person's behavior that is upsetting me? Um, and then listen to others. Uh, what's happening from their perspective? Ask them questions. How are they feeling? And why are they feeling that way? And then also listen to the Holy Spirit. What is it that I'm not understanding? Um, what is it that God's feeling? What is God doing in this situation? And, and hear what it is that, that's happening. I recently got angry at one of my children because they were getting a bad grade. 
and, and I found myself feeling really, really frustrated at this child because we had been around and around on this and here's this, this bad grade and I went in and I had some words with the child about it and the child had some words back at me about it and it looked like we were, we were starting to get in that kind of, that place where we were real sideways with each other and when I stopped and thought about it, I thought, well, oh, okay, what's happening with me? Why am I feeling angry? Like, well, I'm imagining that if my child does not get good grades in high school, then they will not get into the college of their choice, and they will be bored and unhappy in college, and then they will be an unhappy person, and then they will have an unhappy life. And so basically what's happening is I'm angry at you because you're causing me to imagine in my mind a future in which you are not happy. Well, that doesn't really make any sense, okay? But that's, that's why I'm feeling angry, but it's probably me venting anger at him is not going to help in, in that kind of uh, a situation, right? And what is this person, what is, what is my child feeling? Well, it turned out that there was yet another assignment that the child was worried they were about to get a bad grade on because they were behind on a bunch of things and didn't know how to get started from here. And as I found myself just praying and listening, God, what are, what are you doing here? I felt like the Lord said to me, you know, this is an opportunity for you to invest in relationship. Oh. <laughs> so what I'm doing is getting mad, but what God is doing is saying, this is, this is a time for you to invest in relationship. And so what we did instead was we sat down together and we talked about strategies for how, how to write this upcoming paper. How do we extract the information that we need from the books that we have? And, and how do we schedule our time so that we can make sure we get the whole thing done? And things went a lot better after that. Um, so last thing on here is make, make a healing response. Choose something to do which will actually help the, the situation. Um, remember again that anger is a useful cue that something is wrong. So if we can identify what's wrong, then we can work to fix it. And there's a number of things that we might do. One is simply just let it go. Um, sometimes it's just not worth it. Sometimes, uh, thinking about this woman with the crazy road rage issues, um, I could get really angry back at her, but there wouldn't really be anything that I could do to, to fix this interpersonal problem that I don't know anything about what it's about. I don't know anything about her. We don't know each other. It doesn't make sense for me to react. It just makes sense to go take a deep breath, pray, and ask God to help me relax. Sometimes it really is. Some, sometimes it's, it's personal with somebody that we know, but you realize, gosh, you know, I'm not really sure that confrontation is necessary here. I think the loving thing to do is for me to just, to just walk away. Um, Another possibility is work to change yourself. Am I, am I reacting to my own issues? Like my, my son's thing with his, with his paper that he was working on. I said, wait a second. You know, what, what I can do to fix this is I can change myself as a parent and I can become more involved and I can help more with, with schoolwork. Um, sometimes it's just you're reacting, we're reacting to our own issues and it's not about the other person. Um, or work to change the situation. Uh, sometimes we just realize, gosh, this, this work situation that I'm in is, is stressful. And maybe there's some ways that we can rearrange how things are happening so there will be less stress and people will be less uncomfortable. Maybe it's a communication problem. Maybe it's just we're not seeing eye to eye when we're talking. We're not understanding each other well. Another thing that we, that we have learned in, in our house, I have a tendency to get really frustrated when I feel as if Jamie has contradicted himself. So if he says one thing and he says something else later, then that tends to make me really upset. It's just a, a trigger issue for me. And so one thing that I have learned is just to say, hey, you know, if you change your mind about something, can you give me a cue that just says, oh, I changed my mind. And if he says, I changed my mind, then I don't get angry because I understand what's going on. I only freak out when I don't know what's going on. So is there a communication thing that can be fixed? Um, and then sometimes this is confrontational. Sometimes we need to say, even forcefully, hey, what you did is not okay with me. It's not okay with me that you did that, and I would like for you not to do that again. 
Um, and again, sometimes we need to say that extremely forcefully. One of the issues that was brought up here was, was human trafficking in the, in the question. When the, when the person wrote in this question about anger, it was, I get angry about child abuse. I get angry about, about injustice. I get angry about human trafficking issues. Um, and again, engaging our anger will not help. If I hear about those things and I go home and I just get really angry, I've not done anything to solve the problem, right? My anger does not lead to God's righteousness. My anger is not wrong. But my anger doesn't lead to righteousness. What I need to do is engage with my compassion, that other emotion that we share with God that will help me to be a change agent. When I start to engage with compassion, then I can make a choice to do something which is going to be constructive. Maybe that looks like putting people in jail. Often that's a constructive thing to do. Maybe that looks like economic development in a community where both the, the victims and the perpetrators have an, os an opportunity to explore a different way of life. Maybe it means bringing the gospel into a community, but engaging with our compassion to constructively address the problem is going to be the way forward with our sense of anger. And then just the last thing on here is um, keep practicing. Just like anything else that we do, we get better and better at it the more we try. The more we learn to take our anger, not let it spin out of control, process what's going on with us, what's going on with others, and how we can address it constructively, the more we're going to find that we don't even start to feel angry very easily. The more we're going to find we are like God in get, being slow to anger because we've practiced how to deal with it. And instead of reacting, we we think and we walk through. Um, I want to just end by reading a, a, it's kind of an old Cherokee proverb or something like that, that my, my dad sent me in an email uh, uh, several months ago that, that I think is really profound. It says this, an old Cherokee is teaching his grandson about life. A fight is going on inside me, he said to the boy. It is a terrible fight, and it is between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. He continued, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside you and inside every other person too. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? The old Cherokee, Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. And I thought about that a lot when I read it, yeah. The one that we feed is going to be the one that wins. And it, it's so hard for us not to feed our anger. Huh? And yet, there's not a good excuse for us to let anger be in control. And our attitude is always to be, to be love and compassion. And so we just desperately need help from the Holy Spirit so that we can feed our compassion and our love and, and not feed our, our anger. Um, I'm going to stand up together and pray and then invite the worship band to come forward. So Lord, we do just ask that you would help us. God, that you would speak to us and that you would lead us, that you would direct us in how to handle our anger and all of our emotions, Lord. And God, just as we worship, ask that you would come and that you would work in us. Um, that you would have your way in us. And so just as we worship together, let's invite the Lord to, to work in our hearts and to bless us. Um, let's worship the Lord. I just want to invite the ministry team to come up to the front. And we'd just like to pray for anyone here who's struggling with anger or struggling with any other emotions that it's hard to get uh, a handle on. 
Remember that it's okay to feel angry, but we don't want to be trapped in our anger. We want to be able to let go of our anger and move on, not let the sun go down on it. And if, and if anger is something that you're trapped in, we like to, to, to pray that you be set free from that. God gave me a, a picture just as we were praying before the service this morning, and it was a picture of a person holding a box, and it was a, a beautifully wrapped present with a big bow on it. And um, as he was opening the, the box, inside it were a bunch of little emoticons, like the pictures that I was showing earlier. And, um, and some of them were, were happy feelings, and some of them were really painful feelings. And as he was looking at them, some of them made him smile and some of them made him cry, but the whole box was a gift uh, to this person from the Lord. Um, and I felt like God was saying that there's, there's somebody here, maybe more than one person, who you have a hard time feeling things. And you feel disconnected from, your, from the emotional part of yourself. And I felt like one thing God wanted to do this morning is to give that back to you. So if that's you, if you feel like, gosh, it's hard for me, I don't know how I'm feeling. I feel out of touch with myself emotionally, and that that part of me has been lost. I want to particularly invite you to come up and get prayer. I feel like God wants to give you a gift this morning that it may in some ways be painful, but in a lot of ways be really beautiful and restorative. So if that's you, come up for prayer. And also if you have any other needs that you'd like to have prayed for, come on up and get prayer. Um, we're going to go ahead and close the service. So if you can take the hands of the people standing around you, let's pray together. Lord, just thank you for, thank you for freedom. Thank you for your desire that we would be a free people. And God, I ask that you would make us uh, people who are both free and sober-minded, Lord, that we would deal, that we would be free in our emotions and that we would handle our emotions well and effectively. God, that you would teach us to be like you. God, that we would be people who engage our relationships and our world with compassion. And God, I ask that that would be contagious, Lord, that you would send us out from here as people who are learning to be like Jesus and that we'd be a blessing to the world around us. And we pray all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day. Come on up for prayer if you would like or head on out.